Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. When the Rhode Island Economic Development Corporation Board voted to approve the 38 Studios deal two years ago, only one of its 13 members voted no. Vibe co-president Carl Waddenston. Today, 38 Studios is toast, and Waddenston is still an independent voice on the board of the EDC. The cigar-chomping manufacturing chief from South County is a vocal advocate of the lean approach pioneered by Toyota. He's got his own thoughts on whether to overhaul the EDC and how to turn around a faltering state economy. This week on Executive Suite, Carl Waddenston's vision for Rhode Island. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Carl, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Ted. Said you were cigar chomping, and there you are chomping I, it I got on it with air. Me. I like it. Uh, so you, I want to start right off. You brought a stack of reports, the new one from RIPEC we talked about on the show last week on changing the EDC and previous ones. You're an EDC board member. What's your initial reaction to this new study? You know, these reports have been done, Ted, for quite a length of time. Atkinson Report 97, 2008, 2005, 6, all over the place, and as well as the Varecki Report. So this probably, the uh, RIPEC report, is an extremely comprehensive report. A lot of work went into this. And if you see the, the, the marks and the hatch marks and everything else, and you have to really read it with an open mind. Because until page 30, my knee-jerk reaction was too complex, too crazy, too controversial, You said too there's tough. nothing new on Channel 12 last week on the evening news. And there still is nothing new because there's nothing new because we have to change a mindset. And we didn't really get into this report on what's the mindset look like? How do we get past that mindset? Because there are a lot of moving pieces. You've started reading it. There's a lot of moving pieces in this one. That is for sure. And I've got uh, my copy right here, too. Well, you have your own ideas on uh, what we should do and sort of a summation of all these reports and what you've seen flowing through them all. And you've brought a stack of a stack. slides to help a stack have visuals of this week on Executive Suite. So walk me through this. What, what, uh, how do you see all these? And, and what's your story you're telling here? Well, you know, I, 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 I've been really sitting and, and thinking very hard on what does it look like? What do we need to do? Is it a who? Is it somebody that's going to lead us through this? Or is it a what? And does the what come before the who? And the what has to come before the who. What is it going to look like? What is our direction going to be? Can we all sing from that? Who are, going to, who are we going to include in this? We need private sector businesses. We need the universities, we need our legislatures, we need the governor's cabinet, and we need just general citizens to get behind that. So to get behind something, you need a big, hairy, audacious goal. <laughs> and what is that? Well, the goal, you know, the goal that I have here is worst to first. Worst being Rhode Island's rankings in these business climate rankings. Yeah, and too many times we hear people trying to legitimize and make excuses for this. Let's just admit that we are worst right now. And once we admit that, it's a defining moment, and we can take off from that point, and we can get to first. And the key to this isn't just a slogan. That's all it is, is a slogan. But it's a mindset, because if we think we're worse and we've got to get to first, how do we get there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things is gaining and sustaining businesses profitably for the state of Rhode Island. Key thing. Sounds get, like number one, the basic goal. The basic goal, the golden rule of Rhode Island. It could be the golden rule of Rhode Island. It can be on the road map there. So you have some steps in mind then? Well, I have some steps. Because you don't get there overnight, and, it's, and this is extremely hard work. Very, very hard work. So it's the small steps solve one problem at a time. Mm -hmm. One thing at a time. Because we take off too much, it's not going to get completed. It's going to be too complex. People won't understand it and they don't have any wins. So you don't necessarily think the top to bottom overhaul approach is the right approach. Uh, some of these are big bang reports. They said, I remember the Varecki report oh, said, we can do man. something big. They are top to bottom reports. And, and the complexity and the sense of urgency that we have now to do a top to bottom overhaul would take too much time. It would be too time consuming. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of good things, Ted, that are happening. They're below the surface and a lot of people don't know about them. And one of the th good things that's happening is our Office of ORR, Office okay. of Regulatory Reform. And Office of Regulatory Reform came about on May 4th, 2010. It was an executive order by the previous administration, right, mm -hmm. to take a look at regulations because they're hampering 
commerce in the state of Rhode Island. Now, so people understand your silos here. DOT is Department of Transportation. DEM is Environmental Management. DVR is Business Regulation. The uh, RIPEC report suggests a Secretary of Commerce overseeing all of them. Uh, regardless of what you think of that, you do agree that there's a problem with these not talking to each other. Yeah, exactly. And this is the beginning slide because there are basically 13 silos and maybe a few more in the state. You know, you have uh, health, and, health and Services, DLT, and, and uh, Fire Marshal, and so on. I just drew a few here as an example. And what happens in these silos is information can flow vertically with inside this silo and DBR. People know how to navigate the system. Mm -hmm. They've learned that, oh, you go to Betty for that. Hey, you go to Joe. Oh, you got an issue? You go to Bob. And somebody comes to the door of this silo. If they had to just work within this silo to get a permit, to get a regulation compliance to do whatever, that would be great. Mm -hmm. But people travel through these, and I'll show you the next slide on that, and each silo has contained information flow. So as a department head, I may not always know what everybody else is working on. Mm -hmm. And this is where people talk about transparency. This is transparency at its best, mm -hmm. because if we can get heads together to learn what they're doing, upstream and downstream, it's a visual that we use in Lean that the people upstream from me are generally giving me work or mm -hmm. doing something and the people downstream are people I'm handing things off to. So if we can work together and know what to expect and know what the outcome is, speed. You get speed. So here's the, here's the piece what happens in Rhode Island and this is why ORR came about. So we have inside customers in the state of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. They're looking for help and questions. When we say an inside customer, you're thinking of a business already here that a needs business. some help. It could be a hair salon, mm -hmm. it could be a car wash, it could be a tutorial service, mm -hmm. it could be a manufacturing firm, it could be somebody that's been here forever, somebody that's been here for a year, somebody that's looking for help and information, they turn to EDC. Then you have outside people, they're looking for the same thing, mm -hmm. it's just that we don't know them yet. These people we know, they're friendly to the state, they've been here forever, they've been supporting us, helping our tax roll, employing people, doing whatever they can do. So they go to EDC, and they go to EDC for answers. Mm -hmm. And the complexity now with all these silos at the bottom is that when EDC brings them to start their journey is that people flow horizontally through vertical information flow. Right. So the handoffs, that's where people just get, the complexity happens. So that's talking to each other within talking government. Talking to each other. You know, I, so for, because for the customer, you think I'm just interacting with Rhode Island government inside the silos, as you put it, they, DBR isn't thinking of themselves as interlinked with DEM, et cetera. Correct, okay. and we need to change that mindset. Once we change that mindset and see that we all have customers, because the biggest thing that I've learned sitting on the EDC board is the total mindset that they say, well, we don't have customers, mm -hmm. or we don't make things. Well, it's the furthest thing really from the truth because customer service in a state agency is paramount, paramount to the success of just customer satisfaction and people feeling good. And yes, they don't make widgets, but they still have information flow. All right, we've got to take a break, and I want to keep going through these slides and ask some questions about 38 Studios and how Vibeco has thrived as a manufacturer in the U.S. despite competition from abroad. Stick with us. You're watching Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. My guest this week is Carl Waddenston. He's the president of Vibeco down in uh, Wyoming, technically, right? Which is the municipality of Richmond. Uh, for those who don't know their Rhode Island geography as well. We're going through his slides on his take on what needs to happen to economic development in Rhode Island. I want to pick up where we left off. Sure. So we left off on the, on the silos. And this Office of Regulatory Reform is probably one of the most profound bills that we have in the state. And Governor Chafee now, with the new accelerated looking at regulations, really made a bold move in this to help support what we're trying to do, make it more business-like, more lean. We're one of five states that actually is looking introspectively to uh, streamline processes, get better customer-based outcomes. So ORR is obtain clear, predictable, and reliable regulation systems. This is beneficial for business and for the citizens as well. Because we all use the services of the state, so if they can do it good for businesses, then when we need to use them, 
They're going to work with speed, predictability. I can hear the groans at home from viewers watching and saying, really, another government office is going to fix our overcrowded oh. government system? So what do you say to those people? Uh, you know, those are the naysayers, the skinic, cynics, and the skeptics in this whole thing. And this is working in so many states. It's working in Wisconsin. It's working in Iowa. I can show public officials and public offices that have changed the paradigm of what traditional thinking is and the mantras, oh, I have to go to that agency, where they walk in and they are wowed. They are wowed like your favorite restaurant, like your favorite place to just go and hang out, that they get it. Mm -hmm. And it's fun. You, you involve everybody in that agency, in that office. It's a whole different management style and looking at how to change from traditional management to new style management of inclusion. So you want good morale in those agencies and departments too? Well, the good morale happens because everybody works on the problems together. Mm -hmm. That's where it all takes off, so people are more in control. Mm -hmm. And this is the inclusion, the communication. So the big thing, the crazy thing that I have here, <laughs> out of all the reports, is this. Is no more EDC boardroom. Think about that. We don't still, have a boardroom anymore. We still have a board, but we no We still board. have a board, but no boardroom. Okay. The state is our boardroom. <laughs> and we played around with this a little bit, but it's really a cool notion that the state is our boardroom. We can go to the universities, we can go to different places. Maybe we go down to the new site at Rocky Point since that's a big win. What are we going to do with it? Mm -hmm. Let's go walk the grounds. Let's meet the people. Let's see what's going on. It's called going to the Gemba. Mm -hmm. And Gemba in lean speak, Toyota speak, is going to where the action is, going to where the problem might be or going to where the opportunity might be. Yep. So what I've said here is no more boardroom. And you know the crazy thing here? Let's see all the department heads mm -hmm. of these silos be in on EDC board meetings. So I do, there's a clear, all these reports, the RIPEC report, your comments here, even things from the past, there's a lot of talk about the need for collaboration, the need for more communication across, not only across state government, but also with, it, with outside constituencies. That's vital, you think? Great, key. Think about, think about just this notion of having this many people sit at the table. Mm -hmm. They mutually learn together, but the only way that you mutually learn together is being open, honest, asking questions, and letting go of your ego. Let me have to let go of the ego. Let me ask you a bit more about uh, your experience on the sure. EDC board. Um, we've sure. got to talk about 30, the 38 Studios deal. Sure. You were the only no vote, and I, I look back at those minutes from July 26, 2010, the day it was voted on, and you, you took that vote, um, and you said at the time you were torn. Why were you torn even then when the others decided it was going to work? Well. As I sat in the boardroom and listened to all the different conversations, I asked a lot of questions, did a lot of homework, and I respect the heck out of everybody on that board. I mean, these board members, both male and female, are the icons, the cornerstones, the eagles of our state, mm -hmm. you know, and really have done some spectacular things in their representative organizations. Now, I've been asked to be a part of kind of a cool group that I look forward to going to learn and give some input to. So as I'm thinking counter to what everybody else is thinking, I'm saying, could I be wrong? Sure. Well, is there what, something I'm what missing? Were you what were you here? What you voted no in the end? Why in the end could you just not pull the trigger on it? Well, again, you're asked to be a board member of any board, whatever board it is, for your knowledge. Mm -hmm for your circle of influence, meaning the people that you know, to, if you don't know an answer, how to go out and ask, mm -hmm. get the answer. And for um, being a part of something bigger than yourself. That's the way I looked at it. So I went out to the circle of people that I knew mm -hmm. in Boston, Chicago, LA, venture capital firms, people that are f were familiar with gaming industry, and just asked their thoughts. Gave me, they gave me good, honest feedback. I went out to the business community here and listened to the business community because as this started hitting the radar screen, you know, your email box gets really full. So instead of avoiding, I picked up the phone and tried to listen to what's going on. I try to look at it as if it was my money, mm -hmm. right? We all work hard for our money. If it was my money and it was my 401k and I had X amount of dollars, it could have been the 75, it could have been $1,000, Ted. It could have been $1,000. Would I want to put that money at risk, and could I see the end result, the outcome of it? And I couldn't see it. And a lot of people were giving me the same kind of feedback, so I had to pass that along. That's why I was there, to pass along the mm -hmm. knowledge and the constituency that I was representing. Let's turn two years after that. Uh, 
what were the conversations like last spring as the company was unraveling? I know from talking to EDC board members that there was some, uh, there were differences of opinion on that board about what steps should be taken. I mean, what was it like? What can you say about that? I'm sitting in every meeting. It begins in April. And I'm sitting there and it's a whirlwind of information coming at us. A whirlwind. And as you're sitting there and I'm watching a lot of alpha leaders because our board that time, this is a new reconstructed board. Mm -hmm. These are new players. There's some retreads from the old board and there's a whole bunch of new players. And even when that happened, the synergy was unbelievable that we were all trying to move Rhode Island to the next level through our expertise, knowledge, and information and the people that we knew. So now we get this whirlwind of information. We're alpha leaders. We're all trying to problem solve. We're all trying to figure out what is the solution, what's the point solution, and trying to gather information as quickly as possible. And so now you're trying to gather information on something that has become way more than just one person can gather the information on. Too many people involved, too many different, and, and people, what I mean by people is not individual people, but too many places in the whole uh, geopolitical landscape of how do we get the right answers? And how do we get them quickly to make good decisions for the state of Rhode Island? That was at paramount every board members We're running thought. up against a break. Uh, just to close out the 38 Studios question, yeah. what, do you think more could have been done to save the company? You know, we didn't get enough information. We all tried like nobody's business to do more. But at the end of the day, we couldn't get information quick enough to make a good concrete answer. All right. Well, we have to take a break. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about Vibeco, Carl's company. Stick with us. You're watching Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. My guest, Vibeco President Carl Waddenston. Carl, let's talk about Vibeco. Uh, you make vibrators. Yes. I'm going to try not to make an immature joke about that, but explain the kind you make and why it's not what people are thinking. We make construction and industrial vibrators. For and what are those? Compaction and handling. Believe it or not, your cameras and probably a lot of the set props here went through vibration testing and analysis to make sure they don't fall apart when they throw them in the trucks and go on site. So it's shaking things up and shaking making it things so up. they can... And it's food, mm -hmm. your co the coffee that we have here in our cups, all the coffee beans went through a vibrator. There's so many broad uses, Ted. It's just phenomenal. And that's the beauty about our business. You, um, you're down in Richmond, you employ uh, 70 people, and yes. you have become a huge proponent of lean principles. I mentioned them at the top. Toyota is known for it. For people at home, the layman who has no idea what that is, what's the most basic version of that? The basic, uh, the pillars, the two pillars of lean are respect for people, mm -hmm. continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. So who wouldn't love that kind of management thinking? Sounds They're good. going to respect, <laughs> but the respect goes up and down, and I'm going to continually improve because mm -hmm. we're all looking to do a better job. And how much is it, you've talked about improvements in inventory, lead times, quality, and you often say it's about process, not people. Sort of flesh yes. that out for us. Why is it well, stuck home for you? The, the, the process is that as you sit and look at your tapes or, or, you know, people come in and say, hey, Ted, you know, that was a great show. Did you think about, and you're like, all right, hang <laughs> on here. You're stepping on my toes. Instead, hey, there's a process I saw that if we standardize some of this stuff, we can take some complexity out. It's just a whole new way of thinking, and they include you in the conversation rather than passing a judgment, passing along the way that they think they share something. Very collaborative, very Japanese, Toyota. Very Japanese, but it's from it. the American Dr. Deming and Joseph Duran. That I didn't and know. And Frederick Taylor and Henry Ford. They loved Henry Ford in Japan. <laughs> they loved them. <laughs> I don't know if you love them back, knowing his history during oh. the war, but that's all right. Um, your products are still made in the USA. Every time yes. we have a manufacturer on, I'm fascinated by the story of how there's been an onslaught of uh, foreign competition, currency wars, all sorts of things going on. What has been the key to being able to keep your company here? And that's where we looked at the long game. You know, a lot of bigger companies look at the short game. They have shareholders. We're privately held, and a lot of Rhode Island companies are privately held. So we look more at the long game. And plus, we didn't have the volume to go overseas. So, you know, I was, in a, I was in a conundrum, and it really didn't make sense. We try to keep everything within our four walls. The more control that we have of our supply chain, the quicker, faster we can react. We deal with 190,000 people globally, and we're growing our customer database at 16%. Do those numbers over 1,300 different products, and it starts getting real complex, really fast, and people want it in 24 to 48 hours. They want it now. How much room for growth do you see? Uh, if you're, is, there, is there room to expand, to, keep, to get bigger? Or are you at a place, a market share you think is stable right now? We can 
double, triple, quadruple our size, and it's all about marketing spin and, you know, working on that work to get our name out. I like, uh, there was a story, the Westerly Sun uh, has done some terrific reporting on your company, and they had a story, I think last year, when Henry Lawrence, one of your employees, turned 64, his employer told him he had to retire. Uh, he's a machinist, he found a job at Vibeco, and 16 years later, he's still working there at 80, or he was at the time. He's 82 now. 80, and he's still working for you. Still working. You know, why, that still working. Why, why, why are you still having there? So think about Henry, 82-year-old guy from Boston. His wife just had a, a fall and a trip and she had to go to rehab. Every morning he'd call in and he'd say, Carl, I can't be there today, but I'll be there tomorrow. And he'd work, an 82-year-old guy working in between schedules with his wife and coming to work. People have purpose. People have connection. People feel valued. People see the bigger picture. And that's what I'm trying to bring to EDC and I'm trying to bring to the state of Rhode Island. You mentioned uh, in that same article one of the biggest problems your company faces is finding qualified manufacturing employees. I hear this all the time, despite 10% unemployment, you're on the EDC board as well. What's your re why is that a problem still? Why wouldn't people have gotten those skills by now to get a job? Well, we've actually rolled back a little bit from that. Now we're looking for values and characteristics because we can train them in anything. So I've been in talks with uh, Department of Labor and Training, uh, Mr. Fogarty and the group there. Let's start looking at the unemployed and see what their values and characteristics are, are really about because that's what companies are boiling it down to. Most anybody can train somebody in something. So let's get that straight. Then we have, then we have people that fit. If you, if, imagine if you match the right values and characteristics to the job and the corporation, your, your length of time staying there is huge and you're happy. The other half of my job, I'm a political reporter. Yes. A lot of people buzzing about the idea you might throw your hat in the political ring at some point and run for, run for office. Have you thought about something? Run for governor in 2014, perhaps? Well, this is why I brought my wife with me that's actually sitting in the studio, Ted. To tell her? No. <laughs> <laughs> she has a Frisbee. Have you ever seen that boomerang from uh, Crocodile Dundee? <laughs> She's going to take this boomerang if I say something. <laughs> If I can make an impact, I'd love to help the state, but I think I can make an impact on the sidelines, helping our leaders and sharing the knowledge that I have. So, you know, let me do that first and see if we can really move this thing. So this isn't the early read on a, a run no, for governor right away not or something right now. like that. You really believe I still, this I still have some of my cigar left. <laughs> when the cigar is down to nothing, then I'll let you know. We have 30 seconds left. Uh, did you always expect to take over your father's business? Yeah. You knew you would be. I, it was in my DNA. Yeah. It was in my DNA. And uh, was it a challenge to take over what your dad did? God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Yes. A story for next time you're on the show. That's all the time we have this week. I want to thank Carl Waddenston for coming on Executive Suite this week. If you missed the show or any other episode, you can watch it on WPRI.com. I'm Ted Nisi. We'll see you next week on Executive Suite. That was awesome. <laughs>